The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond and Platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. Okay, this is uh, Drew Levine who is here to talk to us about how to contribute to open source. She's the uh, director of the community development for the VSD, PCBSD project and is current chair of the BSD certification group which is working to you know, create standards for certifying BSD administrators and she also serves on the board of the BSD, the Free BSD Foundation. Stuff on that up. Well, there we are. Everybody hear me okay? Got a little bit of an echo there. So today's talk is how can I contribute to open source? And I guess before we start, just sort of get an idea, how many people in the room think that they actively contribute to an open source project? Okay, so I know Chris does. So everybody else is here to learn what, what are some of the things you can do to contribute. Okay. So this talk, I've actually used it from both sides of the coin. So we're gonna discuss some of the reasons why someone should get involved in open source. And we're gonna look at it from both as a new contributor point of view. So why would I get involved and exactly what can I do? And we're also gonna look at it from someone who's already involved in open source. How can we get our project to be more friendly to new contributions so that people feel welcome uh, when they come and start with our project. So we're gonna take a look at what is it that you can actually do. Uh, typically people will think, well, if I don't write code, is there anything else that I can do? Uh, how do you actually go out and decide which community you're gonna start um, doing contributions to? And if you are a community, how do you actually attract new contributors? And then we're gonna look at some of the uh, barriers uh, that prevent people from contributing and what are some of the things that a project can do uh, to reduce those barriers, to make it easy uh, for new contributors. Um, usually I don't have pictures in my slides and once in a while somebody will complain, gee, you never have any pictures in your slides, it's all text. So there's our mantra for today. Open source is good for me, I will fully embrace it. And hopefully by the end of the talk, you won't feel so much like Bart Simpson. You'll feel like, yes, I would like to go out and do something for open source. So we'll start with, if you're currently not contributing to a project, why would you even bother to get involved? So basically, why me? Why are you looking at me? And I'm Irish, so I always answer a question with another question. So my first response would be, why not you? You know, why is it that you can't contribute? If we look at it from a more practical point of view, there is literally tons of stuff that needs to be done and there's not enough people to do it. And every project definitely needs more people to put in more hours on stuff. Even if you have a project that's been around for a while and it has a good base of contributors, over time, people's lives change. So you get people to get married, they have kids, they change jobs and the new job is crazy. So that there still needs to be people to come in and to um, help fill in those gaps. And really one of the main reasons why I personally contribute to open source is it's a lot of fun. So you always hear about all the work that needs to be done, but you can have a lot of fun doing it. So that's, a good reason to contribute. If we start looking at it, well, let's look at some of the practical things. Uh, let's be selfish about it. Is there anything that I'll get out of it if I start contributing to open source? 
And certainly if you're a young person, especially if you're still in school or you're looking towards graduation, open source is a great way to differentiate yourself from the rest of the, the people in your class because this is something extra that you can show to employers. And in this day and age where nobody has a job that's going to last all their life, it's always good to be forward thinking. And open source is an excellent way to add to your experience portfolio. And there's all kinds of good stuff that could work its way onto your resume. When you're working in an open source project, you're actually learning how to use various tools, and a lot of those tools are used in industry. So it's a way to um, be able to work collaboratively with other people, and typically it's in a large, almost a production-like environment. So it's different than you just setting up your own lab at home and playing with stuff. Open source isn't just about the techie skills, you also get to learn soft skills because you have to deal with other people. And you're dealing with people who are in different age groups, um, people who don't always speak the same language natively, people from all over the world that have different cultural stuff. And you have to learn how to be able to effectively communicate with a wide range of people. And open source is one of those things where you can sort of do it as you can in your spare time, and you get to learn stuff while you're doing that. When I went back to school uh, to learn IT, uh, one of my professors told me we're going to be learning about networking, as in the cables and stuff. But in the art industry, networking has nothing to do with cables. It's really about making relationships with people and using that to further your career. So one of the best things you get open source is you do uh, get a large network of people. And they're people that are sharing the same interests that you have, whatever project it is that you're working in. The other cool thing is you get to benefit from the experience of other people. And depending upon what project you're in, some of those people are actually famous. And they've actually done some really cool stuff. And you actually have opportunities to meet with them and to talk to them and to learn from their experience. And if you're thinking about landing a job, it's great to have a network of people behind you. The other thing that I like to let people know about is in open source, basically all of the rules of the game that happens in industry don't apply. So if you're trying to make a name for yourself, uh, say in a career or in a large company, there's basically a set of steps that you have to go through. You have to put your time in, it takes years, you have to meet the right people, and you have to do cool stuff. Open source, basically none of those rules apply. You can just go in and start doing stuff, and over time you can actually become an authority on whatever it is that you're doing. And that's something that you really don't see any place else. One of the things I like to encourage, especially young women, or people who are immigrants or, you know, um, um, are known f uh, for being discriminated against, is in open source, it's a great way to break the glass ceiling. Because in open source, you're known for what it is that you do, and usually most people have no idea what you look like. They have no idea how old you are. Often they don't even know what sex you are. Um, so the barriers that you usually come across when you have to portray yourself in person typically don't apply in an open source scenario. And the other thing in this day and age is most employers, especially tech employers, will Google you uh, before your job interview and you want to make sure they can find you. And contributing in open source is a great way to get your name out there. And it actually shows the stuff that you're doing stuff that's very interesting to employers. So that's sort of all the good stuff. Well, how do you get at some of that good stuff? And what I always encourage people is it helps to find a community that you will work well in and that will provide you the experience that's going to be useful to you. 
So basically, the better the fit, the better the benefits. And finding a good fit is a two-way street. So it's going to involve what you can bring into that community and what that community has to offer you. So all of the following tips in the rest of the slides are basically two sides of one coin. So if I have a bullet point, it should be what the contributor is looking for in a project, and it should be what the project is providing to its contributors. Often the hardest part of getting started in a community is wondering, okay, there's like 10 million open source projects out there, which one do I want to start contributing to? So um, I'll give you some ideas for tips on finding a good community, but often if you do a little bit of research ahead of time to see what's available, uh, you'll save yourself some time later on. So if you really have no idea where to get started, you want to create yourself a project shortlist of possible communities to look into. When you're doing your research, you want to look for opportunities that are going to match your interests, whatever it is that you're trying to gain experience in. And a couple of things I like to warn people is you may find a project that uh, technically meets all of your requirements. So if you're doing development, it's in the language that you want to develop in, um, you know some of the people. But just because technically it's a good fit, you may find there may be personality conflicts that get in your way. So you may find the community itself doesn't match your personality. If that's the case, I always encourage people to shop around and don't feel the need to stay that once you start in a community, you're sort of stuck there. And it's really sad when you see people have bad experiences and just throw up their hands and say, nope, I'm not into this open source thing. It was a bad experience, not doing that again. They should really look for a different community. So let's look at the different types of contributions. So what can you actually do uh, if you're going to contribute to community? So obviously the thing that we think of first is development, so actually dealing with code. So if you are interested in development, one of the things you should look at is what languages do you already know, or is there a specific language that you want to gain more experience in? And if you go to any of the sites such as SourceForge or Olo, you can go in and do language-specific searches to see which projects use which languages. You should also decide if you already have familiarity with a certain version control system. Typically, you'll want to research your short list of projects to see what are they using for revisioning. So if you like Git and can't stand subversion, you should pick a project that uses Git. And usually how most people get into projects is they already know one or two people uh, that are already associated with a project. And that's usually a nice way to get in, uh, especially if, if it's the language that you want to work in. If you, as a developer, are, are looking, researching various projects, uh, one of the things you should do is find out what are the communication channels for that project. So does everything occur on mailing lists? Does all discussion occur on IRC? And you're going to want to look up uh, the specifically the de development team's channels. So if there is a dev mailing list, you should join it and just start watching the threads, see what sort of things get discussed. If there's a dev IRC channel, uh, go in and see sort of what the tone is on that channel. So do they do productive work there? Uh, do they cut each other's work up and it's a dangerous place to be? You want to sort of have some sort of familiarity with which devs are doing what and how they go about doing their stuff. Uh, most projects are going to have some sort of bug tracking system. So you're, first of all, going to want to see what the tracking system is. You're going to want to see if there's any documentation on how to submit a good uh, uh, bug or submit a patch. So you're going to want to be familiar with what's expected. And typically, your first entry point will be to submit patches. And typically, they'll go in a queue. Somebody will look at it and hopefully get back to you, give you some feedback, and maybe commit it uh, into the project. 
And if you're eligible for Summer of Code, uh, go ahead and apply for it with a particular project in mind. One of the nice things about Summer of Code, besides the fact uh, that you get a little bit of money out of it, is you actually get paired with people in that project that deal with development. And that's a great way to make relationships and for them to get to know you, what your code is like and what you're capable of. And most projects uh, usually get uh, their summer code students usually hang around and remain as contributors. Now, if you're looking at a project, uh, some of the things you're going to want to look at is obviously, is there a bugs database? And is there any limitations on who can either submit bugs or patches? Sometimes you have to um, know someone before you can submit code. And that's a bit of an uh, entry barrier. Depending upon the language, uh, some languages are more strict in their syntax. You're going to want to see, do they have a style guide that they expect you to adhere to? You're going to be submitting code. And if they do, you're going to want to read through it, and you're going to want to follow its instructions. Usually the sign of a good project to uh, get involved with is if it provides opportunities to be mentored by more senior developers. So uh, some of the projects, if they see you starting to submit patches and they like your stuff, they sort of take you under their wing and they'll work with you yeah, so that you can um, become more involved in the project. Uh, another way that's uh, good to get started is to find a project that has regular code sprints or regular uh, uh, bug fixing um, sessions because that's a great way for a bunch of people to work together on stuff. And again, it's a good way to um, work with your code. Uh, some projects will actually have summits at conferences where developers will meet and they'll discuss uh, stuff during the day. And if there are uh, summits who can participate, do you have to be like one of the main gods in the project or can someone who's newer uh, participate in that sort of thing? And ideally, if newer people are allowed to participate, uh, they'll have some sort of session to guide the new people uh, to make sure that they're talking to the right people in the project. So that's code. One of the other areas which is very useful but you don't see as much is the whole Q&A thing. So with Q&A, um, it's one thing for code to build and compile and to be released. It's another thing to see how does it actually work when users are using it. And this is a way where even if you can't write code or you can't submit patches yourself, you can still let the developers know there is a problem and this is the error and this is how I get this error. And for Q&A, basically, all you have to do is download either their testing beta, release candidate versions, whatever the software is, go through it. So if it's command line, go through all the switches, try all the different scenarios. If it's menu driven, start going through screens and clicking on everything, seeing what works and what doesn't. Now the only trick to being a good Q&A person is you have to be able to carefully record what it is that you see and what you did to get to that error, because that's what's going to be useful to the developers. And oftentimes, we'll see people who actually go to all that work. Maybe they'll mention it on IRC. And you'll say, oh, write that down, because we need that for the developers. It's like, no, no. And they stop at that point. And that doesn't help anyone, because if they've come across a problem, other users will be coming across a problem as well. So this is one way you can be very helpful to the community. Now, as a project, if you're wanting to encourage that, uh, one, uh, it's helpful to have a published release schedule so people know when code freezes, when your betas are available, when your RCs are. And it's also very helpful to actually make announcements. You know, RC1 is now available. Um, this is where we would like you to send your error reports. So it's helpful to have a mailing list which is devoted to just testing or um, to allow um, some sort of tagging in your bug tracking system 
so that you realize what's happening there. And even more useful than that, uh, does anybody actually respond to that feedback? It's actually a lot of time to start going through stuff and carefully recording. And if it just goes into a black hole when you submit it, you've just lost yourself a good contributor. And it's also useful, especially to new testers, uh, to have a guide to say, um, this is what is good to write down in your feedback, so we can give everything that the developer needs without him having to go back to you. Next type of contributions would be documentation. And if you are um, interested in writing, you're going to want to look for projects. One, do they actually have a documentation team? And sometimes it just goes down to, does the project have any documentation? <laughs> and if so, how long has it been since someone's looked at it? If there is a documentation team, uh, depending upon the age of the project, um, you may find that some of the tools they use to manage their documentation actually have a fairly steep learning curve. So a lot of the projects are using things like DocBook or SGML, and if you've never dealt with those before, it could probably take you a day or two to get up to speed. And you have people that have been doing documentation for years, and they still have to look stuff up. So you have a tool with a very steep learning curve. If that is what the project is using, are there guidelines to actually get new users, sort of like the 10-step guide to DocBook? Or do they provide opportunities, for example, over IRC or at conferences, to actually get new doc um, people started on using the tools? So an opportunity to sit down with someone and say, this is what you do, uh, this, is, this is how we do our tags. The other style of documentation that's become more popular in the last couple of years uh, basically has no learning curve, so that's wikis. Uh, wikis have their own set of problems, though. So typically the syntax isn't that hard, and there's a, uh, a help to that. Um, but for the wiki itself, what is the account creation process? Can anybody create an account? Do you have to go through someone in the project to get an account? Um, is there someone who actually gets emailed the changes, or is this just a spam trap that catches all the crud from the internet? And is there a process for actually publishing the contents of the wiki in other formats? Because oftentimes, from an end user perspective, reading a wiki is not as nice as reading a PDF for an EPUB. There are other types of doc contributions. So um, one of the things you can look at is how open is the project to publishing other types of material. So if you want to start a technical blog and have the project point to it, uh, if you're interested more in just writing specific how-tos, uh, can those actually get contributed? And will they be published? And some people are more interested in doing things like interviews or articles or white papers. And does the project care if you write that sort of things? And will they publish it or link to it? And the other thing is, does the project have a contact person? So if you want to do an interview, uh, is it obvious who do you contact? Or if you want to write articles on something that's happening. So that's something that a project uh, can be uh, publishing. Related to documentation contributions is localization and translations. So um, if you're interested in localization, you're going to want to find a project that is suited to localization. So typically, that's dealing with GUI menu screens. And do they seem to have any active translation teams? So is uh, software available for several languages? And if so, what languages have been translated? And is it one of those um, that you want to add to, or is there an existing team? One of the nice things about localization is there are tools available that sort of automate all the back-end hard stuff and present a graphical editor. So basically, the translator will see the original English. They'll see in their language if, there's, uh, if it's been um, translated yet and they can just type in the translation. So that means from the translator point of view, they don't have to 
looks like our battery's getting low on the laptop. Um, from the translator point of view, um, they don't have to learn a tool, they just have to do translations. And one of the software that's really nice for that is Poodle, which is open source. Uh, translations themselves tend to be a bit muckier, so if you're actually looking at translating existing documentation, again, you're going to want to see A, is there documentation? Uh, B, are there already translators? And if so, what languages are translated? And is there a process for generating um, different formats for the translated docs? In practice, uh, translation tools aren't as automated as localization. So often the project has to make their own backend scripts, either to get into their doc repository, uh, suck things out, suck things back. And uh, typically, depending upon how their docs are created, um, there, there's a lot of manual intervention in order to create different formats and to make them look half decent. So that one tends to be less automated. The one thing about dealing with localization or translations is you don't necessarily need technical knowledge because what you're translating already exists. So it's already text in a menu item or it's already documentation that's been written. You just have to be fluent uh, in the language that you're translating to and from. Uh, one way projects can assist translators is to actually have a style guide because there's nothing worse than reading a translation where all the acronyms have been translated out. Sometimes you'll get people that will take command lines and they'll try to translate that. So you gotta figure out what gets translated and what doesn't. Uh, I know some projects, it's just sort of everybody knows in their head and you have to tell new people. It's a lot easier to just take the time to write it out uh, so translators are aware of it. Next type of contribution that you don't hear spoken of very often is dealing with user interface design. And it really depends upon the type of software and if it's suited for that. Um, so I know KDE, for example, has done a lot of work in user interface design. And uh, another thing that you don't see as much as well, and again, GNOME and KDE work towards it, is accessibility. So these are things that may be of interest to some people. Uh, if that's the sort of thing that you are interested in, um, one of the things you want to look at, does the project even take seriously um, requests for UI enhancements? So if there's some sort of menu that, um, as an end user, it makes no sense, you have no idea what you're supposed to be doing in there, if you submit a bug report about that, will anybody even look at it? And is nice design actually part of the roadmap creation process? Or it's just, no, we just want to work technically under the hood. So if you're interested in UI, that's the sort of thing you'd look at. We're starting to get m more into the non-hardcore techie stuff. So if you're interested in graphics design, Pretty well every open source website out there, their website looks like crap. So one of the things you could do is go in and bring them into the 21st century on their website. Uh, a lot of projects don't even have a logo or what would be recognized as a brand. Um, users love artwork and they love to download artwork associated with the project and it's it takes talent to actually make good artwork. So that's something that you could contribute to a project. If the project has publications, is it all text or does it have nice cover art and that sort of stuff? So there's all kinds of graphics things um, that a design person could contribute. Social media contributions. So the big thing these days is having a Facebook page, a Twitter account, a blog. Somebody has to actually keep all that stuff up, and it's hard work to actually keep that content fresh. And that is a great way for a new contributor to, one, um, get an idea of what's actually happening within the project, all the interesting stuff, and to get that information out there uh, to other users. And if the project has all that stuff, 
would I have any clue if I went to the front page of their website? Is that something that I would easily find? Even brand new users who may not have as many skills as they think they need in order to be able to contribute can help other users. So if you have some, um, some experience with the software, you will, can always find people who know less than you do. And you can always try to point them to the right resources. And Oftentimes, it's really handy to have someone uh, possibly with more skills just sort of keep an eye on the mailing lists and the forums and to notice if there are threads that get missed that nobody responds to. Because there's nothing worse than asking a question somewhere and all you hear is cricket, cricket. It's like you get nothing back. So it's nice to have even people just sort of keeping track and make sure somebody gets some sort of answer. Uh, may not be what they're looking for, but at least they were responded to. As a project, it's important to actually recognize the people who do that. It is a fair bit of work, and it saves other people who are doing other stuff, it saves them a lot of work and a lot of questions that they don't have time to deal with and they shouldn't have to deal with. So it's actually a very important contribution. Uh, when it comes to advocacy, even if you're brand new and one day old in the software, you can still be an advocate. And usually the newer users actually have more enthusiasm for a project because they haven't gotten um, uh, jilted on it yet. So every project needs help in this. And there's all kinds of things that you can do. So brochures, events, contests, surveys. One of the things that doesn't happen off enough and is really useful is data mining. Usually there's all kinds of content that nobody takes a look at and generates stats about. Uh, doing a news feed or a blog roll, creating ads. So those types of contributions allow you to use whatever talent and imagination you have and it doesn't necessarily require you to have deep technical knowledge in order to contribute. So that's sort of some of the stuff that you can do. I haven't covered everything, but sort of uh, gives you an idea of what's available. I want to start looking at, um, well, how do I find a good project and what sort of barriers um, may I come across? So one of the things you should take a look at is what communication channels are being used by the project. And every project is different. So pro some projects, everything happens on mailing lists. If you don't join the mailing list, you don't know what's happening. Um, as a new user, uh, we all know that it's important to, be, uh, to know what channels are available and to know what sort of discussions are appropriate for each channel. Because you don't want to be the newbie that finds their way onto the dev mailing list and asks some really stupid question, because you won't do that again. So you do want to know what are the correct channels. Now, from a project point of view, especially if a project has been around for a while, it's a good idea to take a look at what channels you have. So, and it really depends upon what your audience is. So a lot of older projects, back in the day when mailing lists were the thing, usually that's still what they use. That's their main communication channels. Now, if you're dealing with developers, that's often very appropriate. But if your audience is uh, end users, and especially if they're a younger audience, they're not going to use a mailing list because that's just not what young people do. And you may find that you're not getting to a lot of people. You may find that maybe three or four years ago you went and you set up a blog and you created all kinds of new IRC channels and they just never get used. So it's parts of the infrastructure that you should probably prune um, because it's, it's just gathering dust. Um, See, so it's good every couple of years or so to see are our communication channels actually reaching the users that we want and uh, are they being used effectively. And you do want to make sure that all of your channels are easily found from the main page of your website and that you have very good descriptions so people know what's appropriate uh, to do on each channel.
uh, as a new user. Um, uh, typically, you're going to want to lurk for a while before you start making a lot of noise. Uh, just sort of see what sort of conversations occur. And uh, if there's archives, you may want to go through those as well, just so you have an idea of what happens. Now, as a project, it's very important to be aware of the tone that occurs on your various channels. And typically, you'll have different tones. You may have highly technical uh, channels uh, where people may be a bit more curt with each other. Uh, you may have more chatty channels where people just shoot the breeze. That's OK to occur on that channel. Um, but one of the things you do want to have is you want to have a policy for what is acceptable and what's not acceptable. And what do we do when somebody does something unacceptable? One of the things as um, new contributors, um, oftentimes people tend to be shy. Uh, they don't want to draw too much attention to themselves because they think, I really don't know what I'm doing right now. Don't want people to figure that out. Um, but people tend to stay when they feel welcome as a person and when they feel that their contributions actually have some value. And one of the things that a project can do is when they're reviewing their communication channels is see do you actually have informal areas where people can just shoot the breeze and get to know each other. Because that allows for some human contact. And that may be a chat IRC channel. Maybe they set up a Facebook page. Um, but there's some area where people can introduce themselves. The other thing is if you're getting starting to contribute to a project, it's great to see if there's some sort of local user group where you can actually go and meet real live people and talk to them. That way you don't feel like you're the only person in the world who's ever heard of whatever it is that you're contributing to. Um, one of the things, most projects have conferences these days, either as part of a larger open source uh, conference or uh, specific to their own software. And you can't underestimate the value of actually going to a conference. If you've never done that before, uh, the chance you get to actually meet people that you've chatted with on IRC or that you've seen the type of contributions they do um, is really, uh, really high value. And oftentimes, if it's your first conference, you may not have the funds uh, to actually afford to go to the conference. And if that's the case, uh, look for volunteer opportunities. If there's something you can speak about, uh, answer the call for paper and see if you're, you get accepted. And see if the project actually has sponsorship opportunities. A lot of the bigger projects do. Uh, projects themselves should have at least an annual conference and uh, hopefully provide sponsorship opportunities. And the other thing the project can do is have some sort of infrastructure to assist users to create their own local events. So either to have artwork or a template for brochures. Um, maybe uh, they can send them CDs to give away at the event maybe have a 12-step guide to starting an install fest or a bar camp or whatever. That way people get to meet other people. Uh, overcoming problems, talk a little bit about that. Um, so if you're going to be a new contributor, um, one of the things you're going to want to learn, uh, hopefully won't be pointed out to you, is you should learn the rules of netiquette. Um, if the project has FAQs, you should actually read them. Um, always treat others how you want to be treated. And be persistent. Uh, there's nothing worse than we see it every day, especially on IRC. Someone will pop in, ask a question at like 3 o'clock in the morning for most people's time zone. Uh, nobody answers within 30 seconds, and then they leave forever. It's like, what's up with that? Stick around. Uh, one of the things, um, you may encounter some sort of ism. And one of the things you don't want to do is don't pretend that it didn't happen. If it happened, know who the leaders are in the project and talk to them and let them know what happened. Uh, hopefully, they will deal with it appropriately. 
And if the project up to that point didn't have a policy for dealing with incidents, hopefully they'll come up with a policy for dealing with incidents. Um, one of the things that may point you that you are in the wrong community is if these things happen habitually and they don't get dealt with. And if you have the personality where you like to uh, go and change that, uh, go for it. Um, but otherwise, you probably will be happier someplace else. Uh, finding opportunities in a project. Uh, projects should have a to-do list, uh, preferably on the, the front page of their website. And that to-do list should contain small, concrete tasks that would be appropriate to new contributor. And ideally, in different categories. So code tasks, documentation tasks, and so on. You should take a look at your infrastructure and see do you have any barriers. So for example, do you force people to go through some sort of account creation process? And if so, is it onerous? You know, do they have to wait for three days for someone to read their email to uh, give somebody a new account? Uh, you also want to take a look at how your submission queues get handled. Do things go in and rot for six months? And if that's the case, that's something you have to take a close look at and see is there something we can do better. If you find that contributions are actually being ignored, nobody responds to them, you really want to take a close look at why is that happening? Do we just not have enough manpower to deal with it? And if so, we need some sort of way to get more people in. Uh, is it a lack of communication? Is it going into somebody's inbox with 3,000 other emails and they're on holidays for the next three weeks? I have to figure out what's happening that things are getting ignored. Uh, having a how you can help list, a little bit different than the to-do list, but it's an excellent way to guide new people. And one of the things is you should have uh, senior people in the community who actually actively look for new people who actually sound like they, because oftentimes either in IRC or the forums, you can tell someone who's just sort of tentatively trying to make a contribution. And the best thing to do is sort of latch on to them and to uh, sort of guide them. So oftentimes, somebody will uh, say something on IRC, and you'll say, that's really good. You should report that. And they'll do the, no, 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 I can't do that. We'll spend 10 minutes with them say, yeah, you can. Here, I'll show you how to submit a bug report, work through it with them. Oftentimes, they'll want you to read their first one to make sure everything's in there. And then once that's submitted, you've just um, created that confidence in that person I can actually do this, nobody's going to laugh at it when it arrives, and nobody's going to think it's stupid. Um, and encourage people. So oftentimes, people will be doing really cool things, and you can say, hey, do you have a blog? Did you write that down? Send me the URL to your blog post, and we'll point to that. That's really cool. Other people would like that. And it's also um, nice to be able to have some sort of outreach program. Um, where the project can reach out to schools to try to get people, or to have some sort of process to say how to um, get our software into the schools. Here are some recommendations of things that you can do. Uh, the other thing is, and when we're looking at barriers, uh, it's nice to go and create your own um, revisioning system, but if nobody else out there is using it, it's not really that cool. It should actually be using recognized tools uh, that can be useful elsewhere. And it's great to take the time to write down how to actually get started with those tools. So here's how to um, download the code base for our project and give them a, a six-step process. Uh, it's always great to have people working together, so you should schedule regular codeathons where people just sit down and write code. Um, Docathons, sometimes ideathons. You know, what is it we want to do? 
face-to-face uh, -face events are always great because they always get people involved. And there's global events uh, such as Software Freedom Day. And the other thing you want to do, you can't acknowledge everything, but it's good to acknowledge contributions, especially if it's one of the first contributions for someone. If people like to know that, you know, I actually did something and it's going to be useful to the community. Uh, worst thing that can happen is you submit something and it sits in a queue for two years. Nobody looks at it. Uh, if possible, uh, pair new contributors with community members um, so they can walk them through the process. And think beyond the code base. There are so many ways that people can contribute that don't deal with code. And remember, open source is about community. So the last slide just has the URL to the slides and my contact email. And I think we have time for questions. I haven't seen any signs go up yet. Yes, we have time for questions. Any questions? I've just overwhelmed you all. <laughs> Either that or lunch has kicked in. Okay, well, thanks for your time then. As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you. WebOS, an OS that works the way that you do. Across all your devices, HP Slate and WebOS, HP.